Hello, and welcome to Episode 9 of C++ Weekly. I'm your host, Jason Turner. Once a week, I will pick some topic of interest in C++ and dig into it with some live coding. In this episode, I'm going to show a quick start of C++ futures. Back in 2008, I wrote a series of articles about multi-threaded C++ programming, and they're still some of the most popular articles on my website. However, these articles are largely low-level compared to what is possible today with the C++11 and C++14 standard libraries. So let's start here with a hypothetical example. Let's say that we want to play around with the C++ random number generation facilities to see what kind of distributions we get. So we're going to create a function. Let's Let's have it return a set of integers because we want to see a sorted set of values that have been returned by the random number facility. So we will call it make sorted random and we want to take some parameter that tells us how many values we want to generate. So in here, we have our return value, which is a set of integers. And we are going to use a random device. And the Mersenne Twister, if I'm pronouncing that right, generator that is seated with our random device. And I am using the example here from CBP reference to get us started. So we want to create a uniform int distribution. And uniform int distribution of let's say from 1 to the number of elements that have been passed in. So now let's say from 0 to the number of elements minus 1. And for this to work we need to include our random header. And now we need some way of using this uniform in distribution to populate our set. So we're going to use the generate in algorithm, which I have the documentation up for here. So generate in can take an output iterator, a size, and the generator that we want to call. So we are going to Let's see, pass it a inserter for our retvel that inserts at the end, but that's, you know, we're inserting into a sorted set of numbers, so saying at the end is a bit nebulous. And we are going to say that we want to generate the number of elements requested. And then we say, what do we put here? We need a generator of some sort. So for our generator, we are going to pass in a lambda. We're going to let it capture by reference anything that's local that we need. And we simply want to return the call of the uniformant distribution object taking our generator object as a parameter. And we're missing our close here. And I just remembered that I forgot to zoom in the font for this. Let's go with this size. OK, so now we are generating num elements, random numbers. And we are inserting them all into our set. And then we will return our etvel. Now, 
in our main, let's simply call make sorted random of, let's say, a million different values. And what we want to know, just for the sake of this example, is how many unique numbers were generated and returned. So we need to include the rest of our headers. And Iostream. We're compiling with GCC 5.2.1, I believe, yes. All right, and we forgot our algorithm header. All right, so this takes a couple of seconds for it to generate 1 million random numbers, and we see that we're getting approximately 632,000 unique random numbers, so we're not fully populating the entire set with the million possibilities. And we're using 100% of the CPU for approximately three seconds. Now let's enable some optimizations, see what differences we get. Now it's taking 1.57 seconds and we're getting 99%. So to get us to the multi-threading capabilities of C++11, let's say we wanted to compare two different calls to this. And we wanted to see what's the difference in the kind of distribution number of unique numbers generated. I don't know, it probably makes sense to actually compare these two distributions. But what we see is that it takes approximately twice as long to run two times as many random number generators. And we have a two core virtual computer here. So let's try to take advantage of both of them. And now we're going to talk about futures. So let's say, how do we simply create a future, something that's going to run in the background? And it's kind of shockingly easy. We're going to call std async. And we need to include our, I believe the header is called thread. No, header's called future. So what we're doing is we're, by calling async, and so we're going to say we want to pass in the function make sorted rand, random. We want to pass in the one parameter that it takes, 1 million. And then we want to call dot get size. And there's a lot going on in this line of code. So I'll break it down in a second. Let's see where this gets us. Compiles, but we're getting an undefined reference to pthread create, so we need to link with pthread. And now when we run, we're still taking three seconds and only using 99% of the CPU. If we were fully utilizing both cores, then we would see something like 199%. So why is that? So first, let's, let's break this down. This would make more sense. What we've got in this line All right, this call right here says auto f1 equals. 
This is telling the computer, telling C++, that we want to make the function make sorted random be called asynchronously, and we're using std async to do that. And what that does is it returns a future. And a future is this handy little thing that holds a value that is promised to exist at some point in the future. And when we call get on it, it returns the value that was stored in the future. So we know that the return value of make sorted random is a standard set of ints. So that is what here f1.get would return. Now, kind of the problem with async is that it can choose for us whether or not these things run actually asynchronously or if they run deferred at the moment that get is called. So you could use this to queue up a bunch of different things that you may or may not know if they need to be calculated or not and just put them in deferred and then delay the execution of them. For the sake of this specific example, we want to force the compiler the runtime to launch these things asynchronously. So we can create two of them and then here let's clean this up just a little bit f1.get dot size and f2.get dot size all right we recompile And now we see that we're using 181% of the system, which means nearly two full cores, and it's taking two seconds instead of 3.4 seconds. So we're not getting perfect parallelization, but we're getting something. And it's really just that easy. And the futures are really cool because they can even do things like store and forward um, store and forward exceptions that have occurred. So if we were so inclined, we could in here throw an std runtime error of hello world and now we can say try f1.get catch const std exception reference and say f1 through exception e dot what and give that a value Compile that. And we can actually see here F1 through an exception, hello world. And we ended up with, a, um, with an uncaught exception because we attempted to get the value a second time from F1.get down here in our print line. So, so this is really the serious quick start to using standard async and futures but that's really simple to use and if you really keep it simple by passing in all of the parameters to your asynchronously launched function as copies and return something that is a copy or an internal value and never try to access any global data or any shared data at all you can get really good parallelization results without having to worry about any kind of manual locking. So play around with that. And as always, leave me some comments on my webpage if you have any questions or comments and or if there's anything else you'd like me to talk about. Thanks.